Hello and welcome to Maximum Avril Levine, the first talking book about Avril. It was written and researched by Michael Sumption. Music is by Amanda Thompson and it's read by Nancy McLean. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. really fast like I like just came to New York I was like 15 came to New York got signed didn't really know what a record deal was but I had one and everyone was like girl this doesn't usually happen you're so lucky and I know like I don't take advantage of it I'm very lucky in a musical climate seemingly bursting with blandness insincerity cynicism and just plain mediocrity it's been kind of wonderful to have witnessed a vital new creative force in contemporary rock and pop the uncompromising sound, style and attitude of Canada's Avril Lavigne has heated up the dire climes of mainstream radio and provided sprightly relief from the torrent of candy-ass commerciality. This is a woman who takes no bullshit from anyone and who beguiles her listeners with searing, awesomely melodic and powerful music from the heart and soul of her being. Her songs reach out for a new generation of disaffected teenagers and transcend rigid generic confines with a healthy dose of angst and attitude. Avril's prowling, hard-boiled songs of candor and rage can stretch, howl and grind with a freedom and power unmatched by any other female singer-songwriter operating today. Always hook-filled, never syrupy, over-egged or streamlined, these mini-dramas of hope, melancholy, frustration and pain ooze an adolescent sexuality and a consummate command of the twisted pop song. Musically, they strut, snarl, slink, spit, jab and groan from within a rough-hued heart and offer solace to all those kids who've been fed pale, insipid imitations of the real thing, until now. In an age when the record industry churns out an endless succession of manufactured pop product, Avril's emergence and success have been all the more extraordinary. A skater punk, a vibrant, independent spirit, a wild child. She's one of those rare talents who began performing to captive audiences from as young as the age of two and never really looked back. A small town kid who couldn't sit still in class, she grew increasingly frustrated by the irrelevance of formal education and always felt out of place in her home setting. This culminated in her single-minded determination to leave her family and seek fame and fortune in New York and Los Angeles while still a teenager. This astonishingly upfront, courageous and self-confident young woman has pushed herself to the limit in order to reap the rewards and has done everything on her own terms. Avril is the coolest kid on the block, a rarefied talent and a model of application with a vision for the younger crowd. She's tough, hard-nosed, committed, self-aware and erudite. She rides a skateboard, eschews the glamour model presentation of other high-profile female pop stars and delivers distinctly un britney lines like Never wore cover-up, always beat the boys up. She's the antithesis of your standard, brain-dead, compliant pop puppet with a thrusting cleavage and nothing to say. Some might find her abrasiveness and her outspoken views uncomfortable but she will not back down and be anything other than herself. Her star just soars and soars. Not only has Dave Grohl proclaimed her to be better than the Vines, but she's topped the album charts, knocking Robbie Williams off his smug perch, made album sales history, caused a storm at the MTV Video Music Awards, dissed Queen Britney, and been nominated for a plethora of music awards. By positioning herself in stark contrast to Ms Spears, she has cemented her status as pop's new independent spirit, a singer whose talents are such that she can afford to sneer at superficiality. While some might argue that such an image is no less contrived than Britney's public transition into womanhood, the distinction lies in the fact that Avril's persona doesn't seem that far removed from her real personality and character. She didn't make the leap from small-town Ontario to chart-topping fame on the shoulders of a cynical, precise marketing strategy but rather accomplished it on the strength of her musical talent and dogged persistence. In the light of this, she seems entitled to play up to her willfully autonomous image. At such a young age, 
She's already exhibited musical skills that far exceed those of her teen pop contemporaries and rivals. She writes songs, plays guitar, and possesses a vocal range that can shift effortlessly from caustic rage to poignant intimacy. She knows that nothing in music loses its shelf life as quickly as a one-trick pony, and so creates from a diverse sonic palette. Avril has single-handedly landed a contract with a major label and has extended the agreement to permit writing her own material. This demonstrates an inner conviction and refusal to infringe her credibility and autonomy. She shows no signs of needing assertiveness classes. Her success, along with the popularity of other singer-songwriters like Michelle Branch, John Mayer and Vanessa Carlton, signals that bubblegum pop's sticky hold is finally slipping. Since signing with BMG Arista for a reported $1.25 million in 2000, her incandescent persona has blasted America's synthetic pop acts out of the water and has followed suit in the UK without resorting to the usual clichés associated with female pop teens. Thanks mainly to word of mouth, her success in Britain has prompted talk of the decline of the reality TV puppet and even of more traditional teen fare such as Atomic Kitten and Blue. There seems to be no limit to her capabilities, and she's intent on building upon her already spectacular successes. Like that little girl who refused to sit still in class, the opinionated, ultra-confident teen has no plans to rest on her laurels. She is in music for the right reasons, not just to make a quick buck in the short term and then get out. Her whole life has been geared to this point, and she's loath to let it go to her head now. There's no looking back, no self-indulgence, just dedication to putting out as much quality music as possible. While Avril's high-energy musical style and vocal range have brought her comparisons ranging from Pink to Alanis Morissette, she has been vehement in positioning herself as a counterpoint to the musical mainstream. Songs like Skater Boy explicitly portray an anti-conformist stance, and her belligerent, no-holds-barred interviews always give good copy. It is a formula which, to date, has worked like a dream. For such a young artist with only one album under her belt, the media interest has been staggering and shows no sign of receding. Her fan base is truly astonishing, and her peers have not been slow to distribute praise. Conjoin this unique persona with an unforgettable voice and a musical arsenal the envy of many musicians twice her age, and it looks likely that she'll be around for many years to come. I performed like hardcore when I was younger, like like all kinds of festivals, like folk festivals, like talent shows, um, fairs, churches, banquets, blah, 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 blah. Avril Lavigne was raised in the affluent middle-class suburb of Napanee in Ontario, Canada, a small town mainly famous for hosting an annual walleye fishing derby. She always stood out amongst the 5,000 residents and started wowing audiences with her voice and personality from the age of just two years, quickly developing a keen taste for attention and outrage. Her father worked for a phone company, her mother was a housewife, and Avril's formative years were spent tuning her ears and sensibilities to the sound of her parents' stereo, which was where her love affair with pop music began. At such a young age, she was indiscriminate in her listening, but quickly thrilled to the magical sounds from faraway places beaming into her home. Allied to this burgeoning love of music was a conviction that she was going to be a star one day. She would stand on her bed and pretend it was a stage, then sing at the top of her lungs and visualize thousands of people surrounding her. Not only would she sing in front of the mirror, she'd pretend she was being interviewed by journalists about her musical career. A middle child who always craved attention, she was bound to burst out of Napanee at some point. School held no appeal. Her life was geared to fulfilling her dream of being a pop star. Always an oddball, she distinguished herself from her female peers because of her decidedly tomboy pursuits, such as playing baseball in the summer and hockey during the fall and winter. She loved playing with the boys, getting dirty and boisterous, and was hardly your conventional dolls and plats type of little girl. At prep school, 
her peers all looked down on her, viewing her with disdain and suspicion. She was seen as a weird little punk, always messing around and getting into scrapes. At times, she got into fights and arguments with her brother, who'd forbid her from going hunting or fishing because she was a girl. By the age of 10, Avril knew that she was destined to become a creative writer of some kind. She wrote little novels in her spare time, stories of intensity and imagination, as well as writing her own poems. She remembers realising she was a poet and freaking out over it. She used to run around the house like a hyperactive kid overdosing on additives, screaming her latest rhymes at whoever would care to listen. There seemed no doubt that she was unique, very different from most children. News of the young Avril's talent spread like wildfire, and she graduated from her bedroom to singing whenever and wherever she could in the local community. She started belting out impassioned gospel in church, and then moved on to festivals. In the meantime, she had fallen in love with the music of Shania Twain, Faith Hill and the Dixie Chicks, and began performing their songs at country fairs and talent contests. Her parents were always extremely supportive, helping to arrange gigs, helping out financially and driving her to the venues. Avril's first CD was a Faith Hill album, given to her as a present from her parents, who'd always loved the radio, but hadn't been able to afford many CDs as she was growing up. Shortly after, she attended her first concert at the Corel Centre, where she saw Shania Twain. Faith Hill, Shania Twain and the Dixie Chicks together provided Avril with the basis of her musical education. Through studying their neo-country songs, she developed an understanding of phrasing, melody and songcraft. Me, writing is very important. Um, I don't really want to be up on stage singing something that someone else wrote. I don't want to be singing someone else's, like what they're, what they've been through and like their past relationships. Avril's first big break arrived at the age of 13 when she won a talent contest organized by an Ottawa radio station. The prize was the opportunity to sing with her biggest musical idol, Shania Twain which blew her mind and gave her her first tangible taste of stardom and the high life. She sang the song, What Made You Say That, with her hero on stage in front of 20,000 people. By this time, she'd already started teaching herself the rudiments of the guitar. At the age of 12, she borrowed her father's guitar and taught herself to play by practicing Lenny Kravitz's Fly Away over and over again. She'd begun writing chords and lyrics on the guitar in her bedroom. As soon as she mastered a G chord, still her favourite, she was capable of toiling away and stumbling on a proper melody with words. Avril's first kiss came in the ninth grade, when a boy came over to her house whilst her parents were out. She didn't have a clue what she was doing, so rumour has it, but she just wanted to get it out of the way. Following this incident came her first ever song, entitled Can't Stop Thinking About You, about a painful crush she had on a boy at school. Her mother loved it, particularly the lines, I'm only 14 years old, really, I'm not that old. And although her songwriting inevitably became less naive and more expressive over time, she nevertheless displayed an innate grasp of a good tune which verged on the precocious. As she became more and more passionate about music, so her tastes began to broaden and encompass noisier, feistier and more challenging forms and artists. Avril fell for the more strident, radical guitar rock sounds of the likes of Green Day, the Goo Goo Dolls, Matchbox 20 and even Hanson. Gradually, she began to move on from her country phase and became absorbed in the music of her new heroes. But there can be no surprise that her biggest influence during this period was none other than that of Alanis Morissette, the controversial, outspoken and sexually frank Canadian singer-songwriter who could be viewed as the natural precursor to Avril. The Jagged Little Pill album was almost Avril's year zero, the moment when her whole musical direction completely changed and went off kilter, taking a massive leap left field. Avril was moved, shocked and excited by her new idol's explicit lyrics, feminist stance 
and musical dexterity. She showed Avril that it was possible to make music which dealt with serious, real-life issues while engaging the listener on a visceral level simultaneously. Everything else seemed to be vapid, petty, insubstantial, cloying and insincere. The You Ought to Know single, with its vitriolic diatribe against an ex-boyfriend, was a revelation and set Avril off on a path of lyrical candour and aggressive sexual politics. This was who she wanted to be. So, armed with a new outlook, a new icon and a whole new approach to the making of music, Avril immersed herself in songwriting. High school proved to be completely uninspiring and she couldn't wait to leave and join the real world. Her musical gifts, aided by the inherent confidence of adolescence, made her an even more forceful character, a loud, extreme, extroverted personality with an opinion on most subjects under the sun. She kept beavering away when she wasn't in school, knocking out tunes and sending off videotapes of her live performances to legions of North American record labels. She learnt to develop a thick skin as rejections came in thick and fast, with no offers on the board. Undeterred, she pursued her artistic vision and resolved to keep honing her creative powers. I just wanted to like get a fresh start and just get some new inspiration and so I went and wrote a ton of songs in LA. The New York songs and LA songs are a combination of what's on the record. Now aged 16 and having left school, Avril took herself off to New York to get inspired and write. It was there she attracted the attention of Canadian-based management company Network, who were responsible for handling the careers of Dido, Bare Naked Ladies, Sum 41, Coldplay and Sarah McLaughlin. They arranged for Avril to meet up with some other songwriters and begin work on a demo tape with producer Peter Zizzo. But she was signed before she even had a chance to finish it. Outside the window of her West Village apartment, she spotted various prostitutes and transvestites. One night, whilst waiting for a cab, a man flashed his bankroll and asked her if she was working that night. From then onwards, she always carried a knife with her. A representative of Arista Records came by the studio to visit Avril and was knocked out by her voice and obvious musicality. He returned soon after with the label's head, Antonio L.A. Reed, who immediately recognised an inner confidence, a will to succeed and the ceaseless invention, which would prove to be Avril's trademarks. He fell in love with the whole package, seeing great things ahead for her, and promptly signed the 16-year-old to a contract reputedly worth $1.25 million in the autumn of 2000. Apparently, before Reed came to the studio, all of Avril's collaborators had tried their best to steady her nerves, unaware that she didn't have any. In fact, she'd never suffered from stage fright in her life. Stunned by the upsurge in her fortunes, Avril briefly relocated to Canada before making the move back to Manhattan to embark on her professional career, accompanied by her elder brother Matt as an escort. Amazingly, this girl, barely out of school, thought nothing of such a major upheaval in her life and plunged herself wholeheartedly into the creative process. This was her living the dream, living out all those bedroom fantasies she'd had when she was a small child. She began working on her debut album, assisted by an army of technicians, collaborators and producers. Despite virtually living in the studio during this period, her efforts initially failed to pay off. She was working with many talented people, but the end results were quite flat and tame. Avril complained that the songs weren't sufficiently representative of her music, and that her individuality was smothered by the talent around her. She had a gnawing feeling in the pit of her stomach that wouldn't leave a vague distrust of the system and a disquiet about her situation. She wasn't feeling the music. It was almost existing independently of her. On hearing initial mixes of these sessions, she put her foot down in the studio and kicked up a fuss. She complained that the songs sounded too poppy, obvious and formulaic, with too many programmed drums and not enough spontaneity. She wanted a rockier, earthier, rootsy sound, which was a million miles away from the commercial slush she was hearing. Moreover, although she'd been signed to Arista strictly as a vocalist, 
She balked at the notion of singing someone else's songs and insisted on having a hand in the writing process. She resisted Arista's efforts to have her perform covers, amending her contract to permit her to compose her own material. She also rejected suggestions that she should have her teeth bleached and wear something sexier than her trademark outfit of baggy pants, a tank top and a necktie. Although she never considered quitting, this period proved to be a tortuous time of stress and uncertainty. Most teenagers on such a handsome contract would have been forgiven for keeping their heads down and placating their record label bigwigs, but not Avril. She threw a few tantrums in the studio and took herself off to Los Angeles to tell the producers that her record needed major changes. Everybody stared at her in amazement as if she was mad, but she got her own way right down the line. I wasn't actually supposed to skateboard in the video and then I'm like, I grabbed a board when they, no one was taping and someone with like a camera on the side. I'm like, dude, tape this. And they like went up and came down and he taped it and then I told them to put it on the video so they did. I, I mean, I asked them to put it on the video. So they did. I was really excited. I'm like, oh, that's me. The first fruit of the Let Go sessions to be released was the complicated single in the early spring of 2002. Radio picked up on it quickly and generated a buzz, assisting its scaling of the singles charts across North America. By the summer, it had reached number one in the Canadian charts and was nestled in the top 15 of the Billboard Adult 40 list. Complicated is an unforgettable single, a genuine teen anthem of vigour, rage, lyrical honesty and musical excellence. On the surface, a simple, mellow, downbeat rocker its myriad charms unveil themselves on repeated listens. A feast of ringing guitar lines, melodic bass inflections, turntable scratches and pissed off vocals, it is a great pop song boasting an infectious hook which lingers in the listener's consciousness for days. The song deals with the ambiguities and screw-ups in relationships and wags the finger at people who are fake and insincere, though Avril claims not to have had any one particular person in mind. She shrugs her shoulders and accepts that life's like this, and then breaks into a tirade against those people who try to maintain a cool facade in relationships, always watching their backs and never relaxing. The lines, why do you have to go and make things so complicated? I see the way you're acting like you're somebody else gets me frustrated, are delivered with the precision of a surgeon. In fact, the whole song can be read as a mission statement or manifesto for Avril's career, putting her credentials on the table the mouthiest R&B diva, telling it like it is. The song received a rapturous reception in the music industry and particularly touched a nerve with a certain kind of morose, stroppy high school girl in North America and beyond. Critics were quick to praise her brazen, ballsy, no-holds-barred approach and rock and roll spirit. Avril was being compared with her longtime role model, Alanis Morissette, and a huge future was being predicted on the basis of this one song. Eager to capitalise on her newfound fame and acclaim, the Let Go album was unleashed for the public on the 4th of June 2002. Incredibly, it debuted at number 5 in the Billboard album charts and achieved 22 consecutive weeks in the top 10. The music press bent over backwards to welcome a bright new star into the fold, while a ready-made fan base of angsty, punky teenage girls clasped a new heroine to their bosoms. For a debut disc, let Go is quite staggering in its reach, sophistication, wit, power and creativity. This is no fly-by-night aberration, but the opening chapter in the catalogue of a genuinely inventive and unusual artist. It is idiosyncratic, unpredictable and unsettling, while at the same time melodic and absorbing. Whereas artists like Dido seem keen to paddle in a pool of harmless, inoffensive coffee table muzak for dinner parties, Avril hits the senses with an all-out attack of snarling, tenacious punk pop, dreamy introspection and lyrical bite. She flaunts sassy vocals, impeccable guitar work and heartfelt emotion on an unprecedented scale. 
That crystal clear larynx raises the hairs on the back of your neck and sends shivers down your spine, whilst raising all kinds of existential issues and metaphysical dilemmas of the average teenager. It is a tuneful, yet raucous, rock-pop blend of adolescent despair and look-at-me rage, pitched halfway between Michelle Branch and Alanis Morissette, though transcending both in its musical range and radio friendliness. The songs are a disparate collection, reflecting Avril's refusal to pigeonhole herself at its rawest extreme, Let Go is defined by simplistic lead guitar motifs, thrusting drums, concise, repetitive refrains and ringing choruses, whilst other tracks burble and lilt with a ghostly elegance and forlorn grace. Each song bristles with a wanton energy, makes little or no concessions to obvious commerciality or contemporary musical trends, and tugs at the heart. Losing Grip is a revelation. Meshing together a Dido-esque melody with loud, screaming axe work, vocal histrionics and uncompromising lyrics about rejection by an uncaring ex-boyfriend. She uses the song almost as therapy, reciting her complaint to her ex with a barely disguised bitterness and hostility. Realising she's now left alone to pick up the pieces, she tells her former lover that he wasn't there for her when she was alone and frightened and probably never appreciated the full three-dimensional Avril anyway. Lines such as, Right now I feel invisible to you, and Why should I care if you don't care, then I don't care, we're not going anywhere, leave nothing more to be said, as the air of futile resignation cloaks the tune in an almost unbearable pathos. The simple yet persuasive chord combination is heartbreaking in itself, yet Avril's vocal delivery raises the song another notch to a level of melancholic splendour. Naked is another storming piece on the album, portraying the flip side to Losing Grip's jaundiced observations, with an unabashed exercise in soul-bearing and vulnerability. The song is a first-person love letter to a partner, written at the precise moment when she realises that her guard is coming down and she can relax and be open with him. This remarkable, beautiful song displays an emotional maturity and a level of observation which eludes many writers twice her age. Every line is delivered naturalistically, with poignancy, genuine feeling, and yet a slight unease which inevitably comes with the release of one's soul to a loved one. She begins by trotting out her daily routine, comparing her prosaic life to a game, then reveals what effect her newfound love has had on her. The walls she's built up around her just crumble, and she has no protection from her fears and insecurities. In the chorus, she pours out her heart and soul, declaring she's never felt as good as she does at this moment. She's emotionally naked, there are no barriers between her and her lover, and she cannot hide any longer from the possibility of love and pain. She experiences a rebirth, a voyage of discovery. She tries to remember why she had to hide away from intimacy and surmises that she'd never previously met anyone like this person who helps her fit in her skin. As perfectly judged as any Carole King ballad and as disarmingly honest and direct as any Bob Dylan classic, Naked paints an exquisite portrait of a woman's return to life from emotional hibernation. Also implicit in Avril's rendition is the knowledge that although any journey has its risks, it's undoubtedly better to embark upon it and gamble than to fail to rise to the challenge at all. Here is a rare example of psychological insight reflected in concise lyrics, which come together to create something genuinely life-affirming and touching. Too Much to Ask is another essay on disappointment in love and the discrepancy between two people's expectations of a relationship. Avril delivers a trademark tongue-lashing to her boyfriend, an insensitive, preening stoner who sees the world through a mirror. She announces her pain and isolation in the two opening lines and then proceeds to sketch out the stages of their relationship, dissecting each level of disenchantment with a curtness and rancour which dazzles the listener. She keeps coming up with examples of his insensitivity, laziness and macho posturing and offers him an olive branch each time only to see him shove it back in her face or ignore her complaints altogether. Her litany of accusations pile up and fall on deaf ears, leaving her alone, afraid of the dark, and none the wiser. We, the objective, detached listeners, might be moved to wonder what on earth she saw in him in the first place, and more importantly, 
Why is she wasting so much time and mental energy on this loser? But the cumulative effect generated by the music and words is ironically one of positivity. I Don't Give a Damn is another album highlight, a frenzied dollop of Avril angst and bile, which pushes all the correct buttons musically and mines a suitably ambivalent lyrical terrain. Dealing with the aftermath of a transgressionary kiss, in which Avril hurls a heap of self-justifying vitriol at the boy in question, this track works on two levels. Firstly, there's the implication that the narrator is in control of the situation, as she so emphatically tells the young man in question. However, on another level, the lady doth protest too much, and her insistent cries of independence begin to wear, prompting the suspicion that she's subconsciously angrier with her lack of self-control than with the anonymous object of her disaffections. Chastising all men as being boorish, unfeeling or cruel sounds like the desperate crowing of a woman who's fallen for the wrong man, although the incessant machine-gun-like delivery of the title invites a suspicion that the opposite is true. The stylistic device used here is clever and inspired, plundering ferocity and sorrow in equal measures, if lacking the emotional depth of Naked. Tomorrow expertly mines the ambivalent attitudes that can arise in a relationship and the disabling effects that uncertainty can impose upon even the most rock-solid of couplings. Avril recounts her feelings of instability and indecision to her lover, who is only too willing to reassure her that everything will be all right. She accepts philosophically that tomorrow is another, different day, and she might have a new perspective on her relationship then. But the astute listener infers a note of resignation or finality in her exposition. Moreover, the telling lines, it's always been up to you, it's turning around, it's up to me, give the strongest indication that her mind's already made up, and the second line in particular introduces the song's soul flicker of intent. Behind the line's sheen of self-realisation lies a tinge of revenge or bitterness. This track is another deftly composed gem, a haunting portrait of real lives in motion and or stasis. Nobody's Fool is a roaring colossus of a song, bolstered by a swagger and a defiance. Lyrically, whilst hardly breaking sweat, it can be read as a personal manifesto or statement of intent, of which the honchos at Arista would do well to take heed. Avril lays her cards on the table from the opening lines, warning anyone who'll listen that she is who she is, insisting that she won't be turned into something else. Though not the strongest or most subtle tune on Let's Go, Nobody's Fool invigorates the listener and acts as a welcome breather from the deluge of navel-gazing introspection and razor-sharp insight elsewhere. Things I'll Never Say is another expertly crafted nugget from the relationship drama bag, though this time refreshingly depicting the female in the role of tongue-tied, taciturn, hopelessly in love narrator, who can't bring herself to tell her partner how she really feels. Avril's humbling soul-bearing induces goosebumps in the listener and is accompanied by music which instinctively begs for mercy. We feel her stomach-churning pain and torture as if they were our own. Anything But Ordinary is an up-tempo rocking ode to individuality and staying true to yourself, swayed by delicious guitar and plaintive vocals. More straightforward than other cuts on the album, this cry for insanity, extremism and individualism amidst the stiflingly mediocre, the commonplace and the plain dull, rocks like a mule and boasts some fascinating imagery. I'm With You is a string-soaked beauty, which employs a drifting mood of melancholy and unbearable tenderness. A triumph of confessional art and melodic sobriety. Its romantic lamentation of a lonely soul crying out for affection on a dark, cold night touches raw nerves of adolescent angst and unrequited ardour with a poetic dexterity that is without equal in modern pop. Its surface prettiness never veers towards saccharine sentimentality and displays a superb arrangement echoing the best classic songwriting traditions. Wistful, steeped in genuine longing and lovelorn loss and crying out for a cover version, this pièce de résistance commands the listener's attention from the off and induces a feeling of genuine pathos, a sad, sad number. Why is another painful song, 
addressed to a loved one by a pissed off narrator who demands answers left, right and center and now. She assures her errant partner that she needs him and won't let their relationship fall apart, but requests to be told how he feels. A tone of desperation runs throughout the song, and seeing as we don't get to hear the partner's responses or side of the story, we're left to conclude that he's up and left, either physically or mentally, a long time ago. Avril sketches out this woman's yearning and fears with aplomb, and the ambiguity of the situation makes for a rewarding listen. We're left to fill in the gaps and come to our own conclusions about this frazzled relationship. Falling Down continues from the front line of the sex wars, this time with the narrator telling her intended that she's too busy enjoying herself and flying free to become bogged down in a more formal relationship arrangement yet. Still yearning to try and touch the sky, she wants to carry on exploring herself and life before the habit of domesticity and routine sets in. The metaphoric mobile articulates the Avril lifestyle experience with a featherweight poetic touch, reminding us all that she's a free spirit, unfettered by the nine-to-five routine or responsibilities. Unwanted grapples with betrayal and rejection, with remarkable insight from the perspective of the person dumped. And Skater Boy is a delicious narrative about the differing paths crossed by two high school kids, him now an MTV rock star, she a single mother. It also deals with the horrors of schoolgirl bitchiness and the shift in perspective that time allows, even sneaking in a morality lesson about the importance of seeing beneath the skin and appreciating people for who they are, not their appearance. If all this on paper sounds like the worst Sesame Street anthem ever, then the fact that it comes dressed up in the most infuriatingly catchy, insanely addictive musical package since the undertone's teenage kicks will come as a pleasant relief. My world is quite brilliant, laying bare her raison d'etre in no uncertain terms and with charm, intelligence, wit and self-parody. Lyrically, the words read like the swaggering one-upmanships of a thousand medallioned bling-bling hip-hop stars, but delivered with conviction, irony and amidst a chunk of inspirational guitar music, the piece delivers unassailable, irrepressible joy. As a whole, Let Go is rich, varied, eclectic in style, forward-thinking, slickly produced and crammed with a host of killer songs, any one of which could be released as a marketable, surefire single. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but manages to pull off the fiendishly difficult trick of being playful and in your face at the same time. I wasn't actually supposed to skateboard in the video and then I'm like, I grabbed a board when they, no one was taping and someone with like a camera on the side. I'm like, dude, tape this. And they like went up and came down and he taped it and then I told them to put it on the video so they did. I, I mean, I asked them to put it on the video. So they did. I was really excited. I'm like, oh, that's me. The first fruit of the Let Go sessions to be released was the complicated single in the early spring of 2002. Radio picked up on it quickly and generated a buzz, assisting its scaling of the singles charts across North America. By the summer, it had reached number one in the Canadian charts and was nestled in the top 15 of the Billboard Adult 40 list. Complicated is an unforgettable single, a genuine teen anthem of vigour, rage, lyrical honesty and musical excellence. On the surface, a simple, mellow, downbeat rocker its myriad charms unveil themselves on repeated listens. A feast of ringing guitar lines, melodic bass inflections, turntable scratches and pissed off vocals, it is a great pop song boasting an infectious hook which lingers in the listener's consciousness for days. The song deals with the ambiguities and screw-ups in relationships and wags the finger at people who are fake and insincere, though Avril claims not to have had any one particular person in mind. She shrugs her shoulders and accepts that life's like this, and then breaks into a tirade against those people who try to maintain a cool facade in relationships, always watching their backs and never relaxing. The lines, why do you have to go and make things so complicated, 
I see the way you're acting like you're somebody else gets me frustrated, are delivered with the precision of a surgeon. In fact, the whole song can be read as a mission statement or manifesto for Avril's career. Putting her credentials on the table, the mouthiest R&B diva telling it like it is. The song received a rapturous reception in the music industry and particularly touched a nerve with a certain kind of morose, stroppy high school girl in North America and beyond. Critics were quick to praise her brazen, ballsy, no-holds-barred approach and rock and roll spirit. Avril was being compared with her longtime role model, Alanis Morissette, and a huge future was being predicted on the basis of this one song. Eager to capitalise on her newfound fame and acclaim, the Let Go album was unleashed for the public on the 4th of June 2002. Incredibly, it debuted at number 5 in the Billboard album charts and achieved 22 consecutive weeks in the top 10. The music press bent over backwards to welcome a bright new star into the fold, while a ready-made fan base of angsty, punky teenage girls clasped a new heroine to their bosoms. For a debut disc, Let Go is quite staggering in its reach, sophistication, wit, power and creativity. This is no fly-by-night aberration, but the opening chapter in the catalogue of a genuinely inventive and unusual artist. It is idiosyncratic, unpredictable and unsettling, while at the same time melodic and absorbing. Whereas artists like Dido seem keen to paddle in a pool of harmless, inoffensive coffee table muzak for dinner parties, Avril hits the senses with an all-out attack of snarling, tenacious punk pop, dreamy introspection and lyrical bite. She flaunts sassy vocals, impeccable guitar work and heartfelt emotion on an unprecedented scale. That crystal clear larynx raises the hairs on the back of your neck and sends shivers down your spine whilst raising all kinds of existential issues and metaphysical dilemmas of the average teenager. It is a tuneful yet raucous rock pop blend of adolescent despair and look at me rage pitched halfway between Michelle Branch and Alanis Morissette, though transcending both in its musical range and radio friendliness. The songs are a disparate collection, reflecting Avril's refusal to pigeonhole herself. At its rawest extreme, Let Go is defined by simplistic lead guitar motifs, thrusting drums, concise, repetitive refrains and ringing choruses, whilst other tracks burble and lilt with a ghostly elegance and forlorn grace. Each song bristles with a wanton energy, makes little or no concessions to obvious commerciality or contemporary musical trends, and tugs at the heart. Losing Grip is a revelation. Meshing together a Dido-esque melody with loud, screaming axe work, vocal histrionics, and uncompromising lyrics about rejection by an uncaring ex-boyfriend. She uses the song almost as therapy, reciting her complaints to her ex with a barely disguised bitterness and hostility. Realising she's now left alone to pick up the pieces, she tells her former lover that he wasn't there for her when she was alone and frightened, and probably never appreciated the full three-dimensional Avril anyway. Lines such as, Right now I feel invisible to you, and Why should I care? If you don't care, then I don't care. We're not going anywhere. Leave nothing more to be said as the air of futile resignation cloaks the tune in an almost unbearable pathos. The simple yet persuasive chord combination is heartbreaking in itself, yet Avril's vocal delivery raises the song another notch to a level of melancholic splendour. Naked is another storming piece on the album, portraying the flip side to Losing Grip's jaundiced observations, with an unabashed exercise in soul-bearing and vulnerability. The song is a first-person love letter to a partner, written at the precise moment when she realises that her guard is coming down and she can relax and be open with him. This remarkable, beautiful song displays an emotional maturity and a level of observation which eludes many writers twice her age. Every line is delivered naturalistically, with poignancy, genuine feeling and yet a slight unease which inevitably comes with the release of one's soul to a loved one. She begins by trotting out her daily routine, comparing her prosaic life to a game, then reveals what effect her newfound love has had on her. The walls she's built up around her just crumble, and she has no protection from her fears and insecurities. In the chorus, 
She pours out her heart and soul, declaring she's never felt as good as she does at this moment. She's emotionally naked. There are no barriers between her and her lover, and she cannot hide any longer from the possibility of love and pain. She experiences a rebirth, a voyage of discovery. She tries to remember why she had to hide away from intimacy and surmises that she'd never previously met anyone like this person, who helps her fit in her skin. As perfectly judged as any Carole King ballad and as disarmingly honest and direct as any Bob Dylan classic, Naked paints an exquisite portrait of a woman's return to life from emotional hibernation. Also implicit in Avril's rendition is the knowledge that although any journey has its risks, it's undoubtedly better to embark upon it and gamble than to fail to rise to the challenge at all. Here is a rare example of psychological insight reflected in concise lyrics, which come together to create something genuinely life-affirming and touching. Too Much to Ask is another essay on disappointment in love and the discrepancy between two people's expectations of a relationship. Avril delivers a trademark tongue-lashing to her boyfriend, an insensitive, preening stoner who sees the world through a mirror. She announces her pain and isolation in the two opening lines and then proceeds to sketch out the stages of their relationship, dissecting each level of disenchantment with a curtness and rancour which dazzles the listener. She keeps coming up with examples of his insensitivity, laziness and macho posturing and offers him an olive branch each time only to see him shove it back in her face or ignore her complaints altogether. Her litany of accusations pile up and fall on deaf ears, leaving her alone, afraid of the dark and none the wiser. We, the objective, detached listeners, might be moved to wonder what on earth she saw in him in the first place and, more importantly, why is she wasting so much time and mental energy on this loser? But the cumulative effect generated by the music and words is ironically one of positivity. I Don't Give a Damn is another album highlight, a frenzied dollop of Avril angst and bile, which pushes all the correct buttons musically and mines a suitably ambivalent lyrical terrain. Dealing with the aftermath of a transgressionary kiss in which Avril hurls a heap of self-justifying vitriol at the boy in question, this track works on two levels. Firstly, there's the implication that the narrator is in control of the situation, as she so emphatically tells the young man in question. However, on another level, the lady doth protest too much, and her insistent cries of independence begin to wear, prompting the suspicion that she's subconsciously angrier with her lack of self-control than with the anonymous object of her disaffections. Chastising all men as being boorish, unfeeling or cruel sounds like the desperate crowing of a woman who's fallen for the wrong man, although the incessant machine-gun-like delivery of the title invites a suspicion that the opposite is true. The stylistic device used here is clever and inspired, plundering ferocity and sorrow in equal measures, if lacking the emotional depth of Naked. Tomorrow expertly mines the ambivalent attitudes that can arise in a relationship and the disabling effects that uncertainty can impose upon even the most rock-solid of couplings. Avril recounts her feelings of instability and indecision to her lover, who is only too willing to reassure her that everything will be all right. She accepts philosophically that tomorrow is another, different day, and she might have a new perspective on her relationship then. But the astute listener infers a note of resignation or finality in her exposition. Moreover, the telling lines, it's always been up to you, it's turning around, it's up to me, give the strongest indication that her mind's already made up, and the second line in particular introduces the song's soul flicker of intent. Behind the line's sheen of self-realisation lies a tinge of revenge or bitterness. This track is another deftly composed gem, a haunting portrait of real lives in motion and or stasis. Nobody's Fool is a roaring colossus of a song, bolstered by a swagger and a defiance. Lyrically, whilst hardly breaking sweat, it can be read as a personal manifesto or statement of intent, of which the honchos at Arista would do well to take heed. Avril lays her cards on the table from the opening lines, warning anyone who'll listen that she is who she is, insisting that she won't be turned into something else. Though not the strongest or most subtle tune on Let's Go, Nobody's Fool invigorates the listener 
and acts as a welcome breather from the deluge of navel-gazing introspection and razor-sharp insight elsewhere. Things I'll Never Say is another expertly crafted nugget from the relationship drama bag, though this time refreshingly depicting the female in the role of tongue-tied, taciturn, hopelessly in love narrator, who can't bring herself to tell her partner how she really feels. Avril's humbling soul-bearing induces goosebumps in the listener and is accompanied by music which instinctively begs for mercy. We feel her stomach-churning pain and torture as if they were our own. Anything But Ordinary is an up-tempo rocking ode to individuality and staying true to yourself, swayed by delicious guitar and plaintive vocals. More straightforward than other cuts on the album, this cry for insanity, extremism and individualism amidst the stiflingly mediocre, the commonplace and the plain dull, rocks like a mule and boasts some fascinating imagery. I'm With You is a string-soaked beauty which employs a drifting mood of melancholy and unbearable tenderness. A triumph of confessional art and melodic sobriety. Its romantic lamentation of a lonely soul crying out for affection on a dark, cold night touches raw nerves of adolescent angst and unrequited ardour with a poetic dexterity that is without equal in modern pop. Its surface prettiness never veers towards saccharine sentimentality and displays a superb arrangement echoing the best classic songwriting traditions. Wistful, steeped in genuine longing and lovelorn loss and crying out for a cover version, this piece de resistance commands the listener's attention from the off and induces a feeling of genuine pathos, a sad, sad number. Why is another painful song addressed to a loved one by a pissed-off narrator who demands answers left, right and centre and now. She assures her errant partner that she needs him and won't let their relationship fall apart, but requests to be told how he feels. A tone of desperation runs throughout the song, and seeing as we don't get to hear the partner's responses or side of the story, we're left to conclude that he's upped and left, either physically or mentally, a long time ago. Avril sketches out this woman's yearning and fears with aplomb, and the ambiguity of the situation makes for a rewarding listen. We're left to fill in the gaps and come to our own conclusions about this frazzled relationship. Falling Down continues from the front line of the sex wars, this time with the narrator telling her intended that she's too busy enjoying herself and flying free to become bogged down in a more formal relationship arrangement yet. Still, yearning to try and touch the sky. She wants to carry on exploring herself and life before the habit of domesticity and routine sets in. The metaphoric mobile articulates the Avril lifestyle experience with a featherweight poetic touch, reminding us all that she's a free spirit, unfettered by the nine to five routine or responsibilities. Unwanted grapples with betrayal and rejection with remarkable insight from the perspective of the person dumped. And Skater Boy is a delicious narrative about the differing paths crossed by two high school kids. Him now an MTV rock star, she a single mother. It also deals with the horrors of schoolgirl bitchiness and the shift in perspective that time allows. Even sneaking in a morality lesson about the importance of seeing beneath the skin and appreciating people for who they are, not their appearance. If all this on paper sounds like the worst Sesame Street anthem ever, then the fact that it comes dressed up in the most infuriatingly catchy, insanely addictive musical package since the undertone's teenage kicks will come as a pleasant relief. My World is quite brilliant, laying bare her raison d'etre in no uncertain terms and with charm, intelligence, wit and self-parody. Lyrically, the words read like the swaggering one-upmanships of a thousand medallioned bling-bling hip-hop stars, but delivered with conviction, irony, and amidst a chunk of inspirational guitar music, the piece delivers unassailable, irrepressible joy. As a whole, Let Go is rich, varied, eclectic in style, forward-thinking, slickly produced, and crammed with a host of killer songs, any one of which could be released as a marketable, surefire single. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but manages to pull off the fiendishly difficult trick of being playful and in your face at the same time.
That's like one aspect of my life that kind of got blown out of proportion. Like everyone's like, so you skateboard? How good are you? And I'm like, dude, I suck. Um, I mean, I like to skate. I like to do it on my free time, but I don't want someone like shoving a camera in my face and a board and being like, here, let's see. Let's see what everyone's talking about. Cause yeah. It's not like that. I'm no pro. It's just something that I like to do and it's fun. 2002 became a landmark year for Avril as her career took off into the stratosphere. Even before Christmas, Let Go had shifted almost 7 million copies, including 3.6 million in the US alone. And Avril became the first artist in the history of America's SoundScan sales chart to sustain five weeks of sales growth. The Skater Boy single maintained the momentum and helped her establish her name and reputation in Europe. She made a series of high-profile television appearances, including The Late Show with Craig Kilborn in August and both Jay Leno and The Late Show with David Letterman in October. US Weekly profiled her and Time magazine interviewed her for a feature on the new wave of female artists, The Authentic Girls. Nickelodeon aired a special devoted to her in August and her song Tomorrow was included in an episode of Felicity in March. She performed an exclusive concert for Radio 1 in November, which went down like a storm. There was even a computer virus named after her, which infected computers through email. Avril picked up four gongs at the inaugural Radio Disney Music Awards ceremony, taking home Best Homework Song for Complicated, Best Female Artist, Best CD and Best Song. She was nominated for Best Newcomer and Best Video at Belgium's TMF Awards, and Best Pop New Artist and Best Pop Female Artist at the Billboard Music Awards. Meanwhile, news of Avril's wild child behaviour was spreading across the US and further afield. In August, she told Rolling Stone that she'd recently got herself into three fights in a club after being taunted. Security guards dived in and threw the rock delinquent out of the venue. Her management had harsh words for her, warning her that she might be arrested and deported from the US if further incidents happened. Possibly her defining moment of the year came at the 2002 MTV Video Music Awards, where she picked up a Best Newcomer Award. As she collected the prize from American Idol winner Kelly Clarkson, she wriggled free from the manufactured pop puppet's embrace and grabbed the award. Clarkson was noticeably stunned and embarrassed by this expression of disgust at Simon Cowell's latest addition to the pop assembly line. This was seen as Avril making a stand against the anodyne product of American Idol, clogging up airtime and chart space. Some accused her much-vaunted authenticity of being cynically constructed and contrived, but Avril was adamant she was for real. She told a magazine that she'd rejected some flattering, glamorous publicity shots because they weren't representative of the real her. She said she refused to wear clothes which displayed her stomach, breasts and buttocks and went on to claim that she could be better than Britney Spears. She ran into further controversy regarding Ms Spears when she ripped into her dress sense in an interview with Chart Attack. She criticised Britney's fashion crimes and even questioned the purported status of her virginity, which she saw as fake. By pouring scorn on her identity and image, Avril distanced herself from the Britney school of music and lifestyle and all that it stood for. She was speaking from the heart, but the whole outburst stood out as a brilliant marketing move, positioning herself in direct contrast to the golden girl of US pop. In the run-up to Christmas, the UK reported that sales of Avril's album had taken on a life of their own, mainly through word of mouth. She ended Robbie Williams' six-week run at the top of the album charts with an album that had already been out for more than five months. The British teen was eschewing the latest TV talent wannabes for an album by a spotty, fiery Canadian in oversized pants and a soiled T-shirt. Even Avril's biggest critics agreed that this had to be a positive development, as well as a sign that the public had grown tired of such cynical plastic pop. They now wanted the real thing. I'm a solo artist and it's like, it's my name, but I have the band vibe and I want 
people, when they hear my name or think Avril Lavigne, to think of me and the guys. That's how much I want them to be involved in this, and I'm making it as much of a band as it can be. In January 2003, Avril received another welcome boost for her career when the influential Newsweek magazine proclaimed her to be the new model of cool. In a piece identifying the good and bad of the past 12 months, they labelled her as the coolest new kid on the block. The anti-Britney was the essence of cool for the younger, clued-up crowd. The man who signed her, Antonia Reid, argued that Avril's rise signified the death of the slick, disposable bubblegum pop. He said that kids could identify with Avril's clothes, attitude and problems, with her rocky tunes and skater image providing a refreshing antidote to the predictable pap which had dominated the charts for so long. At the end of January, Avril embarked upon her first headlining tour. The Try to Shut Me Up tour encompassed Singapore, Seoul, Scandinavia, Germany, Italy, Holland, Belgium, Britain, US and the rest of North America. Gob supported her on all her North American dates, with swollen members joining Avril and Gob at the Canadian gigs. As the awards season kicked in, the name on everyone's lips was Avril Lavigne. She was nominated for two Brit Awards for Best International Female Solo Artist and Best International Breakthrough Artist, which were to be announced on Thursday the 20th of February in London. Before that, she was nominated for an NME Award in the category of Best Solo Artist. The ceremony was to take place on February the 13th at Poonana in Hammersmith, London. She was also in the running for no less than five Grammys in the categories for Song of the Year, Female Pop Vocal Performance, Pop Vocal Album, New Artist and Female Rock Vocal Performance. The ceremony was due to take place in New York on February the 23rd. On March the 1st, the Canadian Radio Music Awards were to be held in which Avril was up for a further five nominations. The categories were Best New Solo Rock Artist, Best New Rock Group or Solo Artist, Best New Solo Artist, Fans' Choice Award and Chart Topper Award. Meanwhile, the Let Go album achieved double platinum status in the UK and hit the 8 million mark worldwide. Avril's career trajectory is on a high and looks set to soar for a while yet. In carving out her niche in modern pop as an outspoken, gutsy, forthright, independent, free-thinking young woman with gorgeous songs and a remarkable voice, she has sent shockwaves out to a world which had grown complacent and accustomed to Ertzat's facsimiles of the genuine article. I'm totally like a confident person. I'll stand up to everybody and tell them like, no, I really believe this. This is what my gut's telling me. I'll, if there's something that's bugging me, like I'll totally speak up to it. I'm not shy and I'm not going to let, it's too risky to let, you know, this is my life. I don't want to like mess up my career and so I need to speak up. Avril is quite an astonishing young woman. She writes, she plays guitar, she sings. She clearly has no shortage of ideas and views about music, life, the state of the world, feminism, or her rivals on planet pop. And she's still so agonizingly young. The sort of person who leaves her family home at 16 and moves across to the US without a moment's thought, purely to realize her lifelong dream, and then relocates again and again within the space of a year, must surely be anything but ordinary. She's extraordinarily driven, ambitious, focused, and balanced for one of such tender years. She's always known what she wanted to do with her life, and she has gone out and achieved it. And most amazingly of all, she's achieved it within the space of a couple of years, when many exceptional talents plunder away for years and sometimes decades before getting their big break. This is one exceptional woman. Avril is neither a purveyor of Dawson's Creek light angst, eardrum bleeding, new metal oblivion, back to basics, balls out rock, or premenstrual sensitivity, but has stumbled upon a sound and a formula all of her own making, which sets her apart from the pack. So what is it that has driven her on to achieve these things? She began performing almost from day one, singing her first solo in church. 
she was determined and motivated from an extremely young age to become a performer of some kind, got the music bug and never managed to shake it off. She's always loved singing and performing in front of crowds. This serves the exhibitionist in her. She only ever dreamed of making it as a singer. Nothing else would do. Avril always carried a great deal of self-confidence around with her, which could sometimes be misinterpreted as swaggering arrogance or cockiness. She always believed in herself and was fortunate to receive the full backing from her parents, who helped get her shows, drove her around, financially supported her and always pushed her to achieve. She's now never at home, always travelling around, touring, recording and promoting herself. Life is spent in hotel rooms, where she can sit on the floor or her bed, strum away on her guitar and come up with chord progressions, throwing melodies on top and adding lyrics. This lifestyle might not suit everyone, but it fosters Avril's creativity and allows her to get on with making more and more music. When she's on the road, she no longer travels on her own, as she's accompanied by a full band who operate like a surrogate family for her. Her band appreciate her dudeness, especially when they go skateboarding together. When having a bad day, she reaches for her guitar and strums her cares away. I was born to rock, I was born to roll, is her mantra. She prefers to wear skatey gear rather than high fashion and has rejected numerous photo shoots. She's always herself, neither afraid of important people nor intimidated by hanging out with celebrities. Sometimes Avril can't quite believe what's happened to her in such a brief space of time and she can become overwhelmed by it all. Stress, whether it be that of constant touring and self-promotion or the higher expectations that come with overnight success, has increasingly become a factor in her life. That's not forgetting that she's still an ordinary teenager underneath, with all the usual adolescent pains and neuroses associated with that awkward no-man's land between childhood and adulthood. At the moment, Avril is simply enjoying being an extraordinary teenage girl. She's worked her butt off to get where she is and has undoubtedly made certain sacrifices along the way. There's no going back. And she wants to be in pop for the long run. like we have something really special and we really connect really well and just it's, it's a strange thing it, it really feels like we're all supposed to be together and I mean I think it's a really cool unique situation. Avril's journey from God-fearing gospel belter to icy angsty guitar idol has been invigorating, astounding, unpredictable and not without a number of leftward turns. Raised as a child in Napanee, she became a performer as soon as she could open her mouth. Her parents weren't massive music aficionados, but the radio sounds young Avril heard exposed her to a secret world of tantalizing beauty, mystery and excitement. Her grounding in gospel in the local church established the basic rules for phrasing, diction and expression. From an early age, she realized that performing music held an enigmatic power over both the performer and the audience. She graduated to singing country in talent contests and fairs and festivals. Her primary influence was the belly-bearing country girl from Timmins in Ontario, Shania Twain. She fell for her swooning voice and pretended to be her while singing in front of the mirror at home. The natural progression was to learn the songs of Shania Twain and then perform them herself in public, quickly winning rave notices for her versions around the country. Faith Hill and the Dixie Chicks also featured heavily in her sets. Then came a radical move in a completely different direction, one which would change her life forever. Hearing Jagged Little Pill by Alanis Morissette turned her world on its axis. This was music which meant something, which spoke of real personal problems instead of the standard, banal, I love you, you don't love me cliches of teen pop. Everything else seemed trivial entertainment, but Morissette was digging deep into her psyche and examining life's unpalatable truths. Musically, it had a kick too, and tapped into Avril's burgeoning discontent with school, her contemporaries, and the adult authority figures around her. 
Morissette came in a package which was too irrepressible, too significant, too incendiary to resist. So, armed with a guitar, a snarl, and enormous reserves of self-confidence, Avril immersed herself in louder, noisier music and absorbed the sounds of the Goo Goo Dolls, Matchbox 20, and Hanson alongside her new female icon. All these influences fed into her muse subconsciously, and Avril soon discovered her own musical voice, her own mode of expression. Church music and the sanitized pop country sounds of her youth laid her foundations for performance, but the cutting-edge guitar angst of these later influences helped inspire her message, style and attitude. Shania Twain showed Avril how to deliver a song, but Alanis showed her what to say in it. At the moment, Avril finds she has little time to go out and buy albums to seek new inspiration, but she's recently discovered the delights of Dillinger 4, Sum 41, System of a Down and Queens of the Stone Age. These are what rock her boat for the minute. There's no knowing which musical direction Avril will sail towards next, but you can guarantee that it will be fascinating. With the onset of maturity, she might evolve into a millennial female troubadour like Dido, a priestess of snotty punk like Courtney Love, a maverick sonic explorer like Björk, or even a mainstream icon of cool taste like Madonna. The wait will be worthwhile. I feel like I've kind of prepared myself for it. Like all my life, this is what I've wanted, what I've dreamed about. And I I knew this would happen. Like I've been singing ever since I was like really young and, and just want, I've wanted this so bad. And it's been like, like I told myself I would do it. Like I would have to. Avril Lavigne has blasted the musical landscape into orbit since appearing on the scene with her inner rage, guitar histrionics and public notoriety. She has the potential to become a major world star if she can maintain her current rate of development and reinvention. Clearly cut from a different cloth to most teen sirens, her astute intelligence, musical depth and appetite for shock tactics mark her out as a visionary talent with a surplus of energy, inspiration, creativity and ambition. She doesn't suffer fools gladly, gives as good as she gets and refuses to play the mainstream by its rules and convention. Her sassy punkiness and down-to-earth wit place her firmly at the forefront of a new generation of female artists who shoot from the hip and disregard manufactured pop product as anathema. Avril's youth makes her talent all the more impressive, but her to thine own self be true creed, particularly when emphasised ad nauseam in interviews, can seem a tiring affectation to some. Whether attributed to some high school trauma or the disorientating effects of instant celebrity, she goes to great lengths to remind everyone that she's her own person. All true and admirable, but for some it has threatened to become a source of irritation. It undoubtedly works for the moment as a selling point for her records. The teenage girls on the website message boards talk about her in hushed tones, as if she was Joan of Arc, but in a press situation it could become a lazy caricature. By music industry standards, one album and a few singles has never ensured longevity and Avril still has to stabilise her career with a strong sophomore effect. The difficult second album syndrome has afflicted even the best artists, but one senses she is more than equipped to deliver, and then some. There are inevitably those who are lying in wait for her to fall flat on her face, perhaps Britney among them, but with such a marketable identity and her rich musical talents, it should be just a matter of time before she begins building upon her impressive catalogue. Only a few years out of small town Ontario, she has refused point blank to be corrupted by the pressures of the mendacious music industry. Let us hope that she maintains her staunch independence throughout the upcoming years of her career and resists the urge to dumb down, pacify her aggression or stoop to the lowest common denominator. The world really is hers for the taking.
thank you for buying Maximum Avril Lavigne. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for further titles on Chrome Dreams coming up soon. If you did enjoy it or have any comments or suggestions, write to us at Chrome Dreams, PO Box 230, New Malden, Surrey, UK, KT36YY, or email on mail at chromedreams.co.uk. Details of our full catalogue are listed on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. Thanks again for listening, and goodbye for now.